Hello again. Today we are joined by Ron Davis and Janet Defoe. Today we are going to be talking about something that is very exciting and I know highly requested, and that is a metabolic trap update. So Janet and Ron, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you so much. So I know people have heard about the metabolic trap a lot and how it works. So, um, and we're really excited about your recent progress on that. So maybe you could just start by giving us a simple description of the metabolic trap to remind people, and then we'll go into your updates. Well, where this uh, started was the fact that we look at uh, what happens in an infection. And uh, with an infection, uh, that's the, often the beginnings of MECFS. So one of the things that happens in an infection, that tryptophan, that uh, amino acid tryptophan that is in the blood, uh, uh, gets transported into immune, a number of immune cells. The, the, the transporter is activated and it's transported into immune cells. Uh, there's a gene called IDO1, and the enzyme made from that gene then processes the tryptophan and converts it to conurinine. Now, the problem is that if the tryptophan gets too high in the cell, then it, it will actually inhibit the enzyme, which is a strange phenomenon. But when it meaning gets a, that it won't process the tryptophan it, anymore, then it will not trust, trust, process the tryptophan. And uh, in, in human cells, uh, if the uh, if it gets uh, blocked, the only way to get rid of the tryptophan is with the enzyme, but the enzyme is not active, so you can't get rid of it. And we're calling that a metabolic trap. And now that you can't make conurinine, you can't regulate the immune system well. So the problem we have with this is uh, we don't know uh, what cells might be trapped. We don't know where they are. Uh, we don't know if it's in the brain. We don't know if it's in the bone marrow, et cetera, et cetera. So it's hard to disprove this hypothesis. So we took the human gene and put it into yeast and made it so we can control it. The human IDO1 gene? The human IDO1 gene, yes. And had it uh, expressed in yeast. Uh, many human genes will work in yeast. <clears throat> and uh, we can, and then to see what's happening, we set it up in such a way that you make conurinine in the yeast. And then conurinine then can be used to make an essential compound called NAD. And uh, you need NAD to make ATP. And if you can't make NAD, you can't grow. So it's a real simple assay to look at, does yeast grow or not grow? It's real easy. So when we do that experiment and we put in a small amount of tryptophan, the yeast grow just normal. If we put in more tryptophan, yeast stop growing. So and on small tryptophan, the yeast IDO1 gene is processing the tryptophan and making NAD, which allows the yeast cell to grow, grow. right? right. And when there's too much tryptophan, it's not able to process the tryptophan anymore. That's right. And the yeast doesn't make NAD and then it doesn't grow. Right. And, and it, you've taken everything else out of the yeast that could process tryptophan. And so right, that this right. is the only way it can make NAD is through this gene. Yeah, the yeast is heavily genetically modified so that it has to have this conurinine in order to grow. Okay. Uh, so, so we've got the trap in yeast. So that shows the trap will work in a living cell. And that was one of the issues. Does it really work? The, the trap was initially discovered in a test tube using pure enzyme. So it works in a living cell. Now, the question is, can we get it out of the trap? And the one way to get it out of the trap is to find some drug, some compound that will interfere with the innovation. Because if you interfere with inhibition, then you don't inhibit the enzyme and it will continue to make conurinine and the yeast will grow. Also, a very easy thing to see. Why is it easy to see? Because it's on a petri dish and you can, you can look at the petri dish and is it growing? You can put it back in the incubator and come back the next day. Has it grown any? Easy, because yeast grows fast. Um, now, it's, we don't use petri dishes to do this because it's too, too, too clumsy. So, uh, but we use, we use a robotic system that we have. Um, so the question is, can we find an FDA approved drug that if we give it to the yeast, 
the yeast will start growing. So uh, years ago, we, we put together a collection of all of the FDA approved drugs, uh, which we were using on yeast to understand how they work in yeast. So we have those in our freezer. Uh, so we took those out and uh, Angela Chu, who's really good at this uh, yeast work, uh, investigated every FDA approved drug. And in fact, she's found uh, quite a few. Uh, I think the last count was 39, but uh, uh, that in fact would allow the yeast to grow. So that's big news. One, right. that you've actually gone through all the FDA approved drugs. Correct. And two, that about 39 of them actually untrap the cell. Right. That's amazing. Yes. Now, the problem is, is that, is that correct or is there some kind of an artifact? And so you always have to worry that when you do science. So is there another possibility? Well, another possibility is that the drug actually activates, uh, and in fact will activate a drug pump in the yeast, and yeast has several. Now, so yeast have drug pumps as a way to defend themselves right. when they get exposed to things. Right. These drug pumps turn on and pump the unwanted thing out of right. the yeast. And so, you thought that you'd turned all those off, but you have to make sure, correct? No, no, you can't turn, there's a lot of them, you can't turn them off. That's not how you do this. Okay. Okay, so, um, but it is a possibility that they are uh, pumping out the, the tryptophan. So one thing that we will then do is to uh, go through and delete these drug pumps. And we can't delete them all because uh, the yeast won't grow well but we'll delete some of the major ones and see what impact that has. And he also told me they normally don't pump out things like this. Well, right? the other, yeah, the other observations that people have is because that's always, if you activate a drug pump and it pumps out your amino acids, you're not in, you're going to be in trouble. So it, 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 it was always a mystery. How in the world do they see the drug and, and not all the essential things that are in the yeast? So they're not supposed to pump out tryptophan. However, uh, we have to be careful of that. So um, we will have to dry a number of assays to make sure that these things are really uh, reactivating the, uh, the, the IDO2, uh, one uh, enzyme. And so that's where we are at the moment. And we have some ideas about what we will do that. Uh, but before we go on to doing human cells, we wanna make sure that we in fact are actually reactivating uh, the yeast. So uh, once that, once we are sure of that, then we'll proceed to go with human cells. And uh, we have been able to trap human cells. It's just a lot more work. Uh, it's much more complicated. Uh, and uh, we don't have a growth assay to do. We have to then look at the transport of tryptophan into the cell, which then gets converted to canarinine. And we'll measure how much tryptophan it, it gets consumed. And so that's an very indirect assay. Uh, but in fact, if that all works out, and it does seem to work in human cells, then we're still not there, because we still don't know where the cells are that may be trapped. So our, our idea is if we use an FDA approved drug that's not very toxic, and doesn't have a lot of side effects, uh, then we could actually get a patient volunteer with, an, with uh, the approval, an IRB approval, to try uh, one of these or more of these drugs to see if it makes them feel better. And that would be under a doctor's care. And that would all be in our doctor's care um, and, uh, and supervised by a doctor. Um, we might worry about the fact that we might want to use a drug that we know gets into the brain because it could be something in the brain that gets trapped. And uh, so um, that will be the, the course of uh, uh, trying a ex human experiment to see if it helps. Well, uh, that's amazing progress. One thing I want to, I just want to bring up here is that this has been going on for a long time. And I know some people have gotten frustrated about, you know, how many times Ron said he's going to try all the FDA approved drugs and why that took so long. and. One thing I want to say about that is it's science. Science takes a long time, but there's reasons, usually specific reasons for what the blocks in the road are. And in this case, 
there's a particularly interesting um, uh, block that happened with the machine they used with the yeast, which he's told you about before, but you might just want to talk about the Palm Pilot again, because it's just well, a little uh, bit humorous and frustrating. Uh, these robotics were used uh, during the Genome Project, and we were characterizing yeast a great deal with lots of different uh, you know, deletions and a, a lot of different technologies where it went into the yeast. And so it's all robotics. It works, but um, we had lots of different problems with the robotics because one of them was uh, it uses an old uh, uh, software from Microsoft that is, uh, we couldn't find a computer that would run that again. But then one of the components used a Palm Pilot, um, if anybody knows about Palm Pilots. But it wasn't just a Palm Pilot, it was a Palm Pilot knockoff. So <laughs> we had to find a new or, or workable Palm Pilot knockoff uh, on eBay. And we did find one eventually and got it working and then got the robotics working again. But Angela, who's actually very good at this, this took months of searching and trying to fix this and trying different routes to, to correct the problem and write new software, whatever you do. Try you know. to get parts from different places. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it was, uh, she did a heroic job of making this stuff all work. It's 20 year old robotics. So um, it works fine if it works, but when it doesn't work, it's really tough to fix. Uh, and none of, none of them are under service contract anymore. And it was going to cost us thousands of dollars to replace it all. And we said, we can't afford that. So we have to fix it in a cheap sort of way. <laughs> so, so the good news for everybody is that it got fixed and yeah. they've gone through all the FDA approved drugs and found mm -hmm. 30 some that actually stopped the trap in yeast. So I'm not going to tell you what they are because I know patients will try them. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and we don't want to do that. Um, uh, we really want to do this under medical supervision. Some of them are really interesting. Oh, that's a tease. <laughs> <laughs> well, a cliffhanger on. <laughs> do you have any other things to add updating or where you're at now with trying it in human cells or? Well, we've done a little bit of work in human cells. The people who are doing those in the human cells are also doing the attaconate. So if we go to do the human cells for this pathway, we shut down the attack and eight research. So we've got to be real careful how we implement that. And we want to do it in a way that is the most efficient and not just jump into it and try to try to do it. We want to make sure everything is working. And in fact, the yeast experiments are actually valid. It's possible that some of them are artifactual and uh, some of them are seen to be real. We want to know which are real. We have about 39 to do. So uh, with a human cell, that's a lot of experimentation. If we can get it down to 10, uh, it would make it a lot easier. So we'll spend some time trying to make sure that it's right uh, in the yeast before we switch to human. So that we also then don't shut down the attack and eight research. And that actually tells you what could happen if they had a lot more money, which right. is they could actually hire more people and do them both at the same time. So a lot of times people ask, you know, you know, what's happening with this? What's happening with that? Well, sometimes it's because the people that were doing that are doing something else. <laughs> and but have, having to do with CFS still. It all has to do with CFS. It's just that uh, we, we have a limited number of, of researchers and uh, they have, you know, they have multiple hats on at all times. And uh, we are, we have specialists and we try to get them to do what they are good at doing. And we just lost our star technician to industry because they paid her a lot more money and gave her stock options. Now this is a startup, right? So it's a hard, it's hard. Okay, well that's exciting. So if you um, again, if you want to contribute to this, you can either donate to <clears throat> OMF.ngo and specify it's for Ron Davis's research, or you can donate directly to the Stanford Genome Center. And this work is has been funded by mostly mostly it's been funded by Vinod Kosla. And by patient donations. And a lot by patient donations, right. So that that we're all really appreciative of that. Yeah.
Patient okay. donations make a big difference. So we want to thank you, each and every one of you who have donated. And thank you so much to Janet and Ron for describing this more. And this is a really exciting update. And we hope you feel a lot of hope from this.